Amen. Well, go ahead um, and take out your Bible and your outline there. Um, and if you would like to follow along, we will be in Matthew chapter 14, the end of it, um, in the beginning of Matthew chapter 15 this morning. This is part three um, of the current sermon series just called Respond. Um, we're going essentially verse by verse uh, through these two chapters to answer this question of kind of when Jesus shows up, what do we do? When the presence of God is among us, how do we respond to it? The first week we looked at the feeding of the 5,000. And just what little can we give? Last week we looked at Jesus walking on water and then Peter and calling Peter to do the same. What does it look like for us to step out of the boat towards Jesus? Those are probably two well-known passages. I will be honest, those are two fun passages to preach. Where the tide very quickly turns when we get to the other side of the lake. And that's where we're going to find ourselves this morning. We're going to look at what happens, this, these couple verses we get about the people who live in Gennesaret, which is where the disciples were headed on the boat uh, before they found themselves in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. How do they respond to Jesus when he shows up? And then we're going to see what happens when the Pharisees and the religious leaders, the elders of Jerusalem, show up. So starting with the, the people in Gennesaret this morning, uh, we get these in the first couple verses, or the last couple verses of Matthew chapter 14. Um, after they, meaning the disciples, had crossed the lake at Gennesaret. When the people recognized Jesus, the news of his arrival spread quickly throughout the whole area, and soon people were bringing all their sick to be healed. Names of places, of people in the Bible are often relatively important, um, or a defining characteristic of kind of what that place or person is to be. And so Gennesaret, it comes from... Two Hebrew words, um, Gennesarim, which literally means garden of princes. And so what, a lot of rabbis, when they write about this, they're like, this is paradise. Um, from a fruitful kind of perspective. It's a very fruitful land uh, with a lot of very valuable resources. But what we get is, in this fruitful land, there are people who are sick. Who are diseased in a fruitful land. They're bringing people to Jesus. And I don't think that there's any mistake or coincidence that these are the verses that actually come right after Jesus and Peter um, out on the, the water during the waves and the winds. Because this, these, these two verses that are just, we oftentimes read over, I think, because we're coming off of Jesus saving Peter, we're headed towards what Jesus is about to say to the Pharisees, and we get this very small encounter right in the middle. But it's a beautiful picture, I think, of Genesis 1 and the Garden of Eden, and really is the, the core of what the gospel message of Jesus Christ is about. A lot of, we spent a lot of time last week kind of diving through these words of Peter crying out, Save me, Lord. In a way, without saying that, expressively in the text, we're getting the same idea. That when these people hear of Jesus, they know they're sick in a fruitful land, and you get this, despite the, the beauty and the perfection of the land of the garden, you've got diseased people. And yet it's Jesus who's in the middle of that garden healing the sick. If you go back to Genesis 1, 2, and 3, we have this Garden of Eden that is paradise. It is perfection. It's a beautiful, fruitful land. And in Genesis 3, with Adam and Eve, the people become diseased and plagued by sin. We walk outside this morning, and there's a beautiful 
nature to be seen, to be experienced. And yet we are still people who are diseased, plagued by sin in a very fruitful land with still God at the center of it. It is one, it's a beautiful image just of what it, the gospel, of Jesus being in the middle of those people. They respond, they recognize Jesus and traveled to him. Now we're told that they travel to Jesus, they bring all of their sick, they bring those who they know need Jesus. The other reason that I love this passage, and I don't think it's a mistake here. Right, because the last two weeks we've been talking about kind of how the disciples have just failed to understand who Jesus is. That they don't understand what Jesus can do with just a little bread. And even last week we talked when Jesus shows up, they're like terrified and they go, it's a ghost. But when we read this text, the people recognize Jesus and they just go. It's almost like I think we're supposed to get this idea that sometimes the common person recognizes Jesus faster than the disciples. But it is this very truth of how they respond when they hear of Jesus, they go. When they know Jesus has showed up to their land, they go. And please keep in mind that they don't have cars. If they're going, they got to walk. And who knows how many miles that they are walking one way just to go see Jesus. There was a local pastor who gave um, a devotional on this, and, and as I sat there, he, he used the analogy of, think of this as if you live in the corner of Dallas Town, and Jesus shows up in the corner of Red Lion. Are you going? Because, but keep in mind, you would have to probably put on your best shoes and walk four, five, miles depending on the distance one way are you that desperate to just get a glimpse of the hope that is in Jesus because they're not just going they're going because they recognize Jesus for who he is that he is this miraculous healer that he is the one who they've heard testimony about all of these scenarios in which we have studied so far there has been a an extreme physical need with the feeding of the 5,000 the people are physically hungry with Peter walking on water he is physically drowning these people are physically plagued with sickness and disease and they understand that if I just go and get a touch of the fringe of Jesus' robe, this is coming off of where the woman who has bled for 12 years just touches the fringe of Jesus' robe. That's why we get this language. And everybody here would have known what this means. They were just that desperate. To even get close to Jesus. In this moment, what the people of Gennesaret really, really teach us is that there is a people group who at some capacity understood their deepest need and were desperate to go be with the one who could change it. All right, are we aware of our need for Jesus, of our deepest need to be healed by Christ. And how urgent are we to get there? Because there's no time. Very few times, I think, in Scripture, maybe ever, do we get this notion where Jesus goes somewhere and then he's just like hanging out there with nothing to do. Right? He goes and then we're just told he's he just finds himself in crowds. Like people are just swarming to be with Jesus. And a lot of times it's because most people, if it's not the Pharisees, they're the religious people which we're going to get to, they understand that 
They're in a beautiful land that was made for perfection by perfection, being God. That we are diseased and separated from God through sin. And it is that touch of Jesus that saves us. Well, I heard a quote this week. I don't remember where I heard it. And it says, Man cannot be saved except from where they are, but they cannot be saved except from the beyond. The heart of this is, you can only get to God from where you currently are right now. You have to come to the reality of your current situation and go from there. All right, we can't be saved from somewhere that we're not. But to that is we've got a problem that there is no human solution to. That we must be saved by something beyond ourselves. And that is Jesus. Right, this passage and little snippet of just the people at Gennesaret gives us a super clear image of the gospel and what it means to respond to the call of Christ. But it comes at, a, I think, a perfect time in Scripture just to tell this story of really who Jesus is, of the feeding of the 5,000, of Peter walking on water, and now these people that are sick. Right? He is the provider of our physical healing. And we're going to get this interaction now in Matthew chapter 15, but it's going to go a little deeper, I think, than the physical, but really touch into our intent of our heart. The elders of Jerusalem, in Matthew chapter 15, I'm um, the first two verses here, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law now arrived from Jerusalem to see Jesus. They asked him, why do your disciples disobey our age-old tradition for they ignore our tradition of ceremonial hand washing before they eat. But they're, they're claiming personal authority. Um, if the, the key phrasing here is, why do your disciples disobey our tradition? It's your people who are not doing things the way we want them to be done. It's also very interesting that a lot of times when you see the Pharisees bringing up a claim, it's, they, they want to attack the disciples of Jesus. Um, and not always Jesus himself. I think that also is just wisdom from experience of when they do try and come at Jesus, uh, they're not often very successful. But they want to take this and say, this is how we're going to do it, and your disciples are supposed to follow our tradition. Right? We're talking about this tradition of ceremonial hand-washing before they eat. It's used as a purification uh, ritual. Anytime we really see a washing or anything really to do with water in Scripture, it's talking about a purification. Baptism is probably the best example that I can give you. Of you are being purified of sin, being buried with Christ, to be risen again in His name. And so, where this comes into the authority debate is this idea that after... The Israelites were in Babylon for, for their 70 years and they returned back. There's a lot of traditions that are added. Just ways to do things. It's not necessarily to say that tradition is bad. I'll give you a little sneak peek. The first sermon series after the New Year is going to be going through the book of Acts to look at what was the early church. Like what did the early church do? What are the traditions of the early church? The problem here with the Pharisees that we see all throughout Scripture is they want to take tradition and make it of equal kind of value to Scripture. That their tradition should be seen as sacred as the law itself. That's the problem. Okay, and so there's this thing in Jewish culture, um, it's called the Talmud. What it is, is essentially how we have study Bibles with commentaries in them. The Talmud is rabbinic commentary on Mosaic law, the law of Moses. Um, so it's super famous rabbis, super successful rabbis um, that essentially give their commentary on the law of Moses. 
Part of this is they make the claim that God commanded essentially everybody to wash their hands um, prior to eating. The concern of this and the problem that arises in this is if you read Mosaic Law, it's those who are unclean that must wash their hands. According to Mosaic Law, Jewish people were not always required to wash their hands. Not only are they claiming personal authority in what well, our tradition should be on the same level of scripture, but it's also we get to determine who is clean and who is unclean. We define what the scriptures mean, and we define who adheres to them. What Jesus is really going to tell them is there is no distinction of Jew and Gentile. It's irrelevant. The physical, ceremoniously cleansing ceremonies that the Pharisees want to do, it's irrelevant. For the scope of eternity, it doesn't matter. Right? It is the internal purification through Christ. Right? He takes us one step further of going through this Right, that the elders of Jerusalem substituted their own tradition for God's law. Right, Jesus replies to them to this question of why do your disciples disobey our age-old tradition? Right, and he, in perfect Jesus manner, asks them a question as well. And why do you, by your own traditions, violate the direct commandments of God? For instance, God says, honor your, mother, your father and mother... And anyone who speaks disrespectfully of father or mother must be put to death. But you say it is all right for people to say to their parents, Sorry, I can't help you, for I have vowed to give to God what I have given to you. In this way you say they don't need to honor their parents, and so you cancel the word of God for the sake of your own tradition. Uh, the message Bible um, talks about when Jesus says, Right, you take your traditions and violate the word of God. Um, it, the message is an interpretation that puts things in very contemporary English to understand. Um, and, it, and it has Jesus telling them that the Pharisees are playing loose with the commands of God. And I think that may help kind of wrap our ideas and unfortunately bring us into this situation and how we handle the word of God sometimes, that we're playing fast and we're playing loose with the word of God to make it what we sometimes desire it to be. What's going on here? Um, the fifth commandment is honor your father and mother. That's what we're talking about here. Now, we're talking about the very commandments that they are, they are talking about, essentially. There was this thing um, in Jewish life. Um, it was called the Corbin Rule, where you as a child could make a Corbin vow with the temple... That's kind of exactly what it is in Scripture, that me as a child, I have a responsibility to take care of my parents. There is money that would go to that. If I take that money and give it to the temple, and make my vow to give that money to the temple, it circumvents me and removes all responsibility that I have. It was a religious way for kids to not take care of their parents. That's about as simple as I think I can make it for you. And what we're talking about here is this, the, the Pharisees create this tradition and put it behind the mask of generous, virtuous giving. You're giving to the temple. You're giving to God. But Jesus lays it out in this very tradition that you have created. You're breaking the very commandment of God that he's given you. So much of the Pharisees clings on, well, everything of the Pharisees clings on their adherence to Mosaic law. Point one for Jesus. And it's through this that they cancel the very word of God. Mark chapter 7 highlights this same conversation and interaction. In the Gospel of Mark, uh, these last verse, 
where Jesus says, and you, so you cancel the word of God for your, the sake of your tradition, uh, Mark writes it as you ignore God's law in substitution for your own. And I think this is the word that's important. It's this idea of substituting what we want for really what is in Scripture. The truth of the matter is I think that's why, as the church, we've ended up in the places we have ended up. Because we desire to substitute our own tradition, what we desire for the Bible to say, in place of what it actually may say. In this, the result of this is Jesus basically says, You worship meaninglessly. Your worship means nothing. Right? He starts out and says, You hypocrites. The first time in the New Testament we get this word, and it's in this very moment. Right, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, for he wrote, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. Their worship is hypocrisy. I don't think this is something a lot of people are really ready to wrestle with. This idea that we may be diseased in a fruitful land and the way in which we worship God may be meaningless and hypocritical. Right? Jesus tells them that their worship is a farce. I did have to look this up. I did Google this word. Right? And what it is, per Google, is it's a dramatic work using buffoonery and horseplay. Do you categorize your worship as horseplay? I don't think any of us really want to go there. And we would not certainly self-identify what we do and worshiping God as horseplay. Yet so often we just handle Scripture so loosely, so carelessly, that what actually ends up happening is this very last part is we begin to teach man-made ideas of what we think the Bible says as exactly what God has said. And we will do all sorts of things with Scripture to try and justify that. We are a Methodist church. This church has been a Methodist church, whether in the UMC or the global Methodist church now, for a long time. The founder of the Methodist Church was John Wesley. Many years after Wesley's life, uh, there was a Methodist theologian named Albert Outler that put together what we now know as the Wesleyan Quadrilateral. It's not created by Wesley. He essentially, they, they took all of Wesley's sermons and basically tried to put it together of how does John Wesley make sense of what the Christian life is supposed to be? And he put it together in this. If you know math, you're probably thinking it's a quadrilateral, but it's really a circle. It's four parts, and that's the important part. Right? The four parts are scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. These cannot be equal. That's why it is not a rectangle or a square like you may expect most quadrilaterals to be defined as. Right, you see scripture as the overarching circle. It has to be that way. Right, it is this, this doctrine of sola scriptura, which means scripture only. The Bible has to be our foundational piece. Like, we have to trust that the Bible is the most reliable document that we have. It is the authoritative source for what we know about God. It's been proven. It's true. If you have doubts about that, I would love to talk to you about it. It is the most reliable historical document that we have. 
in history. For the Christian faith, Wesley often puts it as, essentially paraphrasing, if the goal of Christian life is salvation through God, the Bible tells us how to get there. Like it is our roadmap that Scripture has to be above all else. That has to be the first place that we run. It is the foundational piece to anything that we begin to understand. The second piece to this, and that's why all the, the three other pieces are inside of Scripture. Because the honest truth is we are all different. We all have different traditions. That's why holidays may be crazy, especially when you get married. We're different. We experience different things. We rationalize things differently. But those cannot be the defining factors of faith. It has to be Scripture. Tradition, reason, experience can only be understood through Scripture. Tradition is how the church has done things, essentially. How the church has taught the Word of God. That's why after the New Year we're going to look at that. Is what did the early church do? What are your church experiences and traditions? Right, reason. The whole point of this was, if we are created in the image of God, then there is a part of us that can know God. If there is an intellectual being, it explains why we are intellectuals. We have the capacity to reason. It's part of being human. If you have logical, consistent reasoning, it will lead you to faith. Those three parts, scripture, tradition, and reason, nobody really through the course of church history would argue about those things. The Bible's important. What you do with the Bible is important. And there is a logical way to think about the Bible. Where John Wesley, essentially, and where the Methodist church split from the Church of England and the Anglican church was this part of experience. Because John Wesley had this very firm belief that a God that could not be experienced was not the God of the Bible. That if you read the scriptures, the goal of Christian life is to experience God. To experience His presence, to experience His forgiveness, the grace, the redemption that comes from knowing of God, but we can really only experience that through the parameters that Scripture has set out for us. To summarize all of that for you, and how do we make sense of all of this? Scripture teaches, tradition affirms, reason supports, and experience testifies. Scripture teaches you what you need to know. Church tradition should affirm what Scripture teaches. Reason will support what the Bible says. And your experience of God testifies to the truth of the God who wrote the Bible. And through all of this, we still have this, like, respond, what do we do? What do we take from this conversation about canceling the Word of God for the sake of our own tradition? You need to validate everything through Scripture. Here's the truth of the matter. And the reason I give you notes, and the reason I hope you take notes. You do trust that during the week I prepare for this, I do my homework on these passages, I study, right? I sit in the presence of God to, to take something. You should still validate every word that I say from this stage. And you have to do it through Scripture. Every experience that we have, the conversations that we have, the thoughts that we have, the beliefs, the positions that we hold, should be validated through Scripture. It has to be that way. Right, 2 Timothy 3 it tells us that all Scripture is inspired by God, and it's useful to teach us what is true, to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong, teaches us what to do, what is right, God uses it to prepare and equip 
his people to do every good work. We cannot know right and wrong with outside of the Bible, outside of God. We cannot be equipped and prepared to do the work of God if we are outside of Scripture. We have to validate everything that we do through Scripture. And part of that is you should be challenged by Scripture. To put it a little more blunt, you should be offended by Scripture at some point. Like, you should read the Bible until it steps on your toes. I would challenge you to open your Bible at some point this week and read until you find something you don't like. And then sit with that for a little bit. Because our nature, if we are diseased people in the land of God, our very nature at times is in opposition to God. So the truth of God's Word should pierce our hearts a little bit. It should step on our toes because we're not to the complete stage of being just like Jesus. This, the fancy Christian word of sanctification. Right? It is the process of us becoming more like Jesus. If we're all being honest, we haven't reached that part yet. Which means there is still work to be done. Right, Hebrews chapter 4, the author tells us, For when the, the word of God is alive and powerful, it is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Scripture will step on your toes, and that's what it is like to become more like Jesus. If we are willing to be challenged and be offended and be formed by Scripture to validate everything that we experience and believe through Scripture, I do believe we will worship with meaning. Because if you do all of that, you will be pointed to Jesus. And if we worship to and through Christ, I believe our worship has meaning. The Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 2, these three verses, 19 to 21, are three of my favorite verses in the Bible. Right, he writes, For when I tried to keep the law, it condemned me. So I died to the law. I stopped trying to meet all of its requirements so that I may live for God. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. For if keeping the law could make us right with God, then there was no need for Christ to die. If you could do it yourself, we wouldn't necessarily need the Bible. And if you could do it yourself, Jesus never needed to be born of a virgin. If you could do it yourself, there never needed to be a cross. And if you could do it yourself, there never needed to be an empty tomb. But the truth is, we are diseased people who need something from beyond something from God to bring us back. And if we believe these words through the Apostle Paul, and we are willing to be crucified with Christ, to live through Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us, I think we get and receive the grace and the truth of the gospel message of Jesus. That's what it means to worship with meaning. It's the only worship that matters. Because it's the only worship that's true. The only way to bring your heart close to God is through Jesus. But these last couple reflection questions. How much does God look like you? And probably, what the heck are you talking about? If we do a real, I think, reflection of our heart and who we think God to be, Right, last week I talked a lot about how sometimes we're more like Peter than we really want to admit. When we write down a lot of who we think God is, a lot of times I think we find out that our idea of God is a lot more like ourselves than we really should, it should be. Right, how much do you look like God? The goal of Christian life is to move more to be like 
Christ. And what is plaguing the church is what we're, we're diluting God to, to be more like us. To fit our mold rather than us growing to be challenged to fit the mold of Scripture. One of my good friends was teaching a, um, a Christian politics. or How do, like, essentially how do Christians and Jesus followers engage in American politics? I was like, good luck, buddy. One of the questions he asked yesterday, and it just resonated and I couldn't stop thinking about it as I was like thinking about this sermon this morning. He asked this question of, are we carrying the commandments of God internally as much as we do externally? Are we carrying the commandments internally so much that it is actually causing us to become more like Christ? as much as we do externally and want to form everybody else into our idea of what it means to be a Christian, what the church should look like, who God is. Right, this question of really, how much does God look like you? And how much do you look like God? Which one of those is greater? The second question. Right, does your worship mean something? And I'm going to challenge you to not rush to an answer on this. I will challenge you this week to sit and, and really think about this. Of how really is your worship defined according to Scripture? Right, is it wholeheartedly our hearts and our lips, every part of our being is honoring God? Or is there a part of our lives that, if it went up against Scripture, would be considered horseplay? Does your worship mean something? And as we have explored, it only means something if it is through the grace and forgiveness that comes in Jesus Christ. Pray with me this morning. God, my prayer this morning is that Scripture just returns to be the authoritative source of our lives. God, as the church, we have to cling to your word. We believe you have written every word of the Bible for every purpose. You have inspired it, written it through human hands. And God, it is how we know about you. It tells us of your revelation and involvement in the world and the creation of the universe in its sustainment all throughout human history. And God, it tells us about Jesus. The birth, the life, the death the resurrection, the ascension, the second coming, everything we need to know about the truth of what has happened, what is happening, and what is going to happen, God, we have to cling to your word. God, as the psalmist writes, just search me, test me, know me. God, it's a dangerous prayer to pray, to really convict us of in ways of our own traditions, our own ways of doing things, our own thoughts, our own beliefs, our own patterns are contrary to you and are permitting us from really worshiping you with purpose, with meaning. God, may we return to you wholeheartedly with our words, with our actions, with our hearts. God, bring our intentions to be in line with your will. Just as Jesus prayed in the garden, God, if there's any other way to take this cup, but if not, thy will be done. God, bring our will to be in like your will in that same manner. That when we worship you, that it is meaningful, it is purposeful, because it is through Jesus. We thank you for grace and forgiveness and mercies in the morning. God, we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.